Isaiah 1 and 2, he said, Hear, O heavens, give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. Here's what he said, I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knows his owner, and the ass or donkey his master's crib, but Israel does not know, and my people does not consider. He said, I brought up children, and they rebelled against me. If you skip down to the 19th verse, he's still talking about this throughout this chapter. He says, if you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. Well, who wants to eat the good of the land? I think most everybody does. Uh, the NIV says you'll eat the best from the land. Uh, the Living Bible says I'll make you rich. <laughs> the Easy to Read says you'll get the good things from the land. Well, you know, um, the good stuff. Who's that for? Hmm? Only for unbelievers? No. Only for people that uh, not, don't care about the Lord, not trying to live for God? You know, the, the enemy has deceived a lot of Christians. And in these areas. And people fight what they call any teaching or preaching on abundance or prosperity. I mean, there's a lot of people, they, they despise it, think they don't like people like me. <clears throat> but uh, they're just shooting themselves in the foot. Because then they'll turn right around <clears throat> and say they need money. Right? They need money. They want money for this. They want money for that. Well, no, don't be a hypocrite. If you believe in being poor, practice what you preach. Right? If you're going to be poor, don't play with it. Do it. <laughs> and if you talk about something nice, many, immediately a lot of people begin to, you know, uh, a lot of folks just assume you're a crook as a preacher. If you, if you have some nice things or, you know, we got, we got an airplane, you, you know, things like that. A lot of times people just assume you're a crook. Well, it could be you just believe different. Why you have to be a crook? <laughs> Maybe we just believe different. Hmm? And we do. If I thought it was wrong, I'd do something different. But the good stuff, the nice things. I mean, this, this plane that we got, uh, there was people that had been involved in, in TV and and media stuff that, that had this. Well, are they the only ones that can have uh, nice things? Hmm? Or you see people that, you know, business, you know. Uh, if we had a, a company that made brake pads and we did really well and enough to buy an airplane, nobody would have a problem with that. Right? Why? Because brake pads are important. <laughs> Need to stop your car, right? But the reason why folks have issue, you know, some people do, I know you don't, but some people have issue with these things, is because they see no value in what we're doing. They see no value in it. And to them, they've reduced the gospel to a humanitarian message. Helping people naturally would be the only worthwhile thing. But no, uh, the greatest need of man is spiritual. Yes, that's right. That's right. Not even natural. The greatest need of man is spiritual. And God, it's good to help people who are in need. It's wonderful. But God never intended that one person be dependent on another man. I don't care how broke you are, how far down you are. If you'll look up to God and begin to do what he told you to do, he will make you free from dependency on man. And he'll bring you up. The Bible says he brings people up out of the garbage heap and sets them with princes. Yes. You believe it? Yes. Well, the good things of the land, you know, the nice stuff, who's that for? 
Is it only for crooks? Is it only for people that don't care about God? The expensive cars. Can, can you feel you run, up, you run up against stuff when you start talking about this, don't you? You run up against, uh-oh, uh-oh. We're poking some holy cows. Did you hear them? Moo, moo. We don't just need to poke them. We need to run over them. We, we need to just put them out of their misery. You know, the $100,000 cars, <laughs> Who's, who are those for? Not for Christians. Now, if you're a good Christian, if you're a good Christian, you'd never have a, a $200,000 car, $300,000 car. No. <laughs> well, if you be willing, come on, read this with me. If you be willing and obedient, what? <clears throat> you'll eat the good of the land you uh, are the best of the land he went on to say the good things that the land produces well the good things that our country produces the good things that are available but what's the qualification you must be willing and obedient and I'll just tell you right now a whole lot of folks don't qualify they do not qualify. They're not willing. They're not obedient. <clears throat> he went on to say, verse 20, if you refuse and rebel, you'll be devoured. Instead of devouring the good of the land, you'll be devoured with the sword, others say, by your enemies, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Uh, look with me over in Ephesians, the sixth chapter. Ephesians 6 and 1. <clears throat> the good stuff. Who's it for? Hmm? Well, it can be for you if you are the willing and the obedient. Now, we, we also need to distinguish there's more than one way to get money and stuff in this world. You can get money and stuff through your own efforts. Uh, you can lie. You can steal. Uh, you, there, there, there more than one way, but that's not the Lord adding it to you. You can add things to yourself. You can take things away from people and possess them. But that's not what this is talking about. The Lord adding something to you, when He adds it to you, it's a blessing that makes rich. Yes. And He adds no sorrow with it. I mean, if you lie and steal and do other things, uh, there's going to come curse with that stuff. And, and you're not going to be able to enjoy it. And, and you're going to wind up losing it too. But when the Lord adds something to you, there's no downside. There's no negative. It's just all blessing. And he will add things to you when you put his kingdom first and seek his things first. All these things will be added to you, he said. And uh, that will involve us being willing and obedient. Here in Ephesians in the New Testament, he said, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Keep going. He said, Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with promise. Why? Why obey? Why show respect? Now see that this would involve willingness. Uh, if there's honor, there would be the willingness. Not just obeying, but a right heart and a right attitude. Why? That it may be well with you. And that you may live long on the earth. Well, what if you're not obedient? What if you're disrespectful and rebellious? Well, then it's not going to go well with you. And you're not going to live long on the earth. You, your life is going to be cut short. The psalmist said, bloody and deceitful men shall not live out half their days. Sometimes people act like, you know, well, when your time comes, you're going. People say, everybody's got a time. 
Well, that's, that's not what the scripture said. It said it's appointed unto man once to die. Didn't say a time to die. If you look at the scriptures, you'll find there are things you can do that'll cut your life in half. And there are things you can do that'll extend your life and add days and, and long years to your life. No, it's not, it's not a set time on the calendar. But when that number comes up, somebody's talking about that. Well, yeah, when your, when your number's up, you're going. And the guy say, well, I'm about to take a flight. What if the number comes up for the pilot? <laughs> now, see, this is wrong thinking. There's not a set day and an hour in time that you have to die. Paul said this talking about, he said, uh, I got a desire to go depart and be with the Lord, which is far better than being here, but which one I'm going to choose, I don't know. What? Which way I'm going to, whether I'm going to stay a while longer or I'm going to go, Paul said, I don't know which one I'm going to choose. Now, a lot of folks say, well, you don't have any choice. Well, you need to read your Bible. Watch about believing stuff that's not in the Bible. Or something you think somebody thought they said that thought they heard somebody else say that the Bible said. If we want it to go well with us, we have to learn and we want a, we want a full life. We have to learn uh, submission and obedience. These words are not politi politically correct. These words are unpopular. The word submit has almost been eliminated from a lot of people's vocabulary. Oh, submit. Ooh, we've been delivered from that. <clears throat> well, no, read the Bible. And what you find is you begin to distinguish between the nature of the enemy and the nature of our Lord. And the nature of the devil is rebellion and defiance, disobedience. Look with me, you're there in Ephesians in the second chapter. Ephesians 2 and verse 1. It says, You has he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. <clears throat> the 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 calls the devil the God of this world, and he is in currently has been for we don't know how long, but and is currently in defiance of God and in rebellion against God. And he breathed this devilish uh, influence into our parents, Adam and Eve, and they defied God's command and rebelled against what he told them to do and not do. And as a result of sin, curse, and death has come into the earth. And currently, the enemy is influencing most of the planet, which is why there is this defiance everywhere you look. There is attitude. <clears throat> and people do not, they do not esteem, they do not value humility. They do not value submission. They do not value obedience. They look at that as weakness and something to be set free from. And so the ideal is nobody tells me what to do. I'm my own man. You know, I don't kowtow to anybody. In other words, in other words I don't submit to anybody. Well, if you don't, then you don't submit to God either. Right. Submission to God is shown in submission to people. 
just like love for God is shown in love for people. You, it just doesn't work. You say, well, now, I, I'm completely submitted to God, but I never do anything anybody else tells me to do. <laughs> You're living in a daydream world. You are not submissive to God. And if you're not willing and obedient, and you're not honoring and respectful, it's not going to go well with you. And you're not going to reach your full potential, and you're not going to finish your full length of days and your, your, your life race and course. The longer we go, Phyllis and I, as pastors, the more we see this. <clears throat> you see people that God gets where they're supposed to be. In relationships, in jobs, in occupations, in churches, in ministry. I mean supernaturally. He heard their prayer. He prepared them. He caused it to happen. And then defiance and rebellion messes it all up. People mess up their relationships. They quit their jobs God put them in. They quit their churches God put them in and wind up out of the will of God. And the Bible says, well, in fact, just uh, look, look with me in Psalms. We'll, we'll put it up on the screen. Psalms 68, 5 and 6. Now, we're, we're going to talk about a number of different things in this series, but one of the main things is just to identify the spirit of disobedience, which is the spirit of the enemy. And identify the spirit of Christ, which is the spirit of humility. How many would agree <clears throat> that the, uh, the devil is rebellious? <clears throat> is that true? You remember, I mean, in Isaiah and in Ezekiel, where he said, I'm, I'm going to exalt my throne. I'm going to be like the Most High. I'm going to do this. And he tried to use his words to exalt himself above what God had given him in defiance. He, he led other angels in rebellion and defiance against God. And he's never going to change. You see in the book of Revelation that even after he's removed from all human contact for a thousand years, then he's released a little while. The first thing he does is goes and stirs up a rebellion against God. <clears throat> That's why he has to be permanently removed from us and from everything because he's, he's never going to change. He, he is a rebel against God forever. <clears throat> do you want to be like that? No. You do not want to be like that. And, and most any Christian would agree with that. But have you ever been stubborn? Have you ever not done what you were told? It's the same stuff. It's the same stuff. Jesus, on the other hand, he said, I didn't come from heaven to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. He said, I always do those things that please him. Is Jesus the ultimate father pleaser? Did he completely submit himself to the father and his plan and his will? Hebrews says, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. He sweat blood in the garden and prayed. And what was the prayer? Not my will, but your will be done. Is it always easy to submit your will to another? Oh, no. It, it can feel like part of you is dying. But that's good. That part of you needs to die. That ungodly flesh, that rebellious stuff, it needs to be nailed. It needs to be crucified and die. And if we'll learn, it's easiest to learn this when you're one year old, two, three, five. It's easiest to learn it then. And many have not understood. They, they, just, they just let kids go and they just let them defy and they act like it's cute. Well, it won't be cute when you're having to go to get them out of jail when they're 14. They're lying to you and stealing money out of your purse and all this kind of stuff. It won't go well with them if they get into the relationship or the job or the thing that they're supposed to. 
If they don't learn how to submit and listen and obey, they'll mess it up. They'll mess it up. <clears throat> now thank God for his mercy. Even after you've messed some things up. If you'll get willing. If you'll get obedient. He can help you. He can restore you. But oh man, you harden your, your heart. You stiffen your neck. You arch your back. No. Nobody can tell me what to do. It goes before destruction. You put yourself in a place where the Lord himself can't help you. I know that's a big word, but study it out and see. Study it out and see. Is the, is the verse after Isaiah 1, 9, 19, is verse 20 just as true as verse 19, that if you refuse and rebel, you'll be destroyed? Is that true too? We want to identify and get rid of every bit of this defiant, devilish spirit. Do you or not? Yes. And in doing so, we will qualify to eat the good of the land. Amen. We will qualify for God to direct us and keep us in such a way that it goes well with us. Everywhere we go, everything we do, the Lord has prepared the way for us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And we're experiencing favor Amen. with God and with man everywhere we go. This does not happen for hard-headed, obstinate people. The proud get resisted. They don't get helped of God. They get resisted. Oh, but to the humble, mm -hmm. he gives Grace. Grace is the marvelous help of God. And with enough grace, you can make it through anything. Yes. With enough grace, you can achieve anything. Mm -hmm. Come on, can you see this? Yes, yes. With enough of God's help, yes. you can make it anywhere. Amen. You can receive anything. Amen. Nothing's too big. Nothing's too hard. But you have to quit being like the enemy and begin to be like your master. He said, come, learn of me. Didn't he say? I am meek. I am humble of heart. And you'll find rest unto your souls. The way of the hard-headed is hard. <laughs> oh, you can, you can have your say. You can stomp your feet. You can walk out. You can throw your tools. You can do your deal. And then what? And then what? Now you got no job and money. Now what? And what if that was the, God, the job God put you in? The Bible said in Ecclesiastes, if the, angers, uh, if the ruler's anger rises against you, don't leave your place. That's what the Bible says. Don't leave your place. What do you do? Well, I'm not going to let them yell at me. You better ask the Lord what he's got to say about it. I don't have to take that. You sure don't. You can jump out of the will of God. You can show everybody. And then wind up out of the will of God. And in Psalm 68, where we had you turn there, go ahead and let's look at it while we're talking about it. God is a father of the fatherless and a judge of the widows in his holy habitation. Can God give you a place when you don't have a place yes. and make you uh, a place of belonging, a place of importance mm -hmm. and value and fellowship. But verse 7, look at this. Well, excuse me, 6. He sets the solitary in families. He brings out those that are bound with chains. But, but the rebellious, what happens to them? They dwell in a dry land. <clears throat> Why did the children of Israel wander around in a dry land for 40 years? Wouldn't do what the Lord told them to do. Would not do it. <clears throat> Wouldn't do it. Let's let our minds get renewed. Submission is not a bad word. Submission is a Bible word. Submission is a word that Jesus practiced. Right? Right? Obedience is a good word. 
Humility is a good word. We don't want to be like the enemy, defiant, disobedient, rebellious. We want to be like our master, humble, meek, submissive, obedient, faithful. Don't you want to be like him? When people meet you, their first impression of you, is it how meek you are? How humble you are? How well you follow instructions. <laughs> now that's somebody that'll do what they're told. Is that their impression of you? <laughs> well, it's kind of quiet in here. Is it too late to change? Say, well, yeah. Can't teach an old dog new tricks. Well, you're not an old dog. You're a new creation. Amen. Is that right? And new creations can change. In fact, they are changing all the time from glory to glory into His image. Can you say amen or, or oh me or I'll think about it? Or, go with me to the book of uh, Numbers. Chapter 13. Now, he mentioned, we've seen reference to the first generation that he brought out of uh, Egyptian bondage, and we've talked about them while they wandered around out in the wilderness. I want us to look at this more carefully and identify this spirit of rebellion. Not so you can judge somebody else, but so you can identify it in yourself. Hmm? Have you ever been defiant? <laughs> I'm looking for a response. Have you? Have you ever been, I, I don't even have to ponder this, you have, I have. Is it okay? It's not okay. It's devilish. Do you want to be like the devil? Do you want to be like the God of this world influencing the world in the spirit of disobedience? Now it's easy to get sucked up in it. It's easy. Everybody's got flesh. Everybody's got pride. It's easy. Something rub you the wrong way. <clears throat> huh? But that's why we need to identify this. I don't care what the reasoning is. It's never okay to be rebellious. I don't care how wrong the other people may be. It's not okay for you or me to be rebellious. Is it or not? Now, this takes mind renewal because a lot of folks think it's just part of being an American. <laughs> huh? That you can't, you're kind of half ready to thumb your nose at anything you don't like. Hmm. No. No. You can't make me. I'm not going to. Well, you need to resist the devil. So when it comes to him, yeah, be as rebellious as you can be. No, I'm not yielding to sin. I'm not yielding to temptation. No. But when it comes to the Lord and anything that pertains to him, no matter how your flesh feels, you don't want to say no. You don't want to defy. You want to be willing to submit your will to his will. And that's not easy. It wasn't easy for the master. So it's not going to be easy for you. I've had people, sometimes people tell me, you know, Brother Keith, I, uh, I'm looking forward to hearing you talk about these things, submission and humility. Submission's always been easy for me, they'll say. <laughs> I know immediately they don't know a thing in the world about it. Submission's not easy for anybody. Well, it is for me. You don't know what it is. Submission's not easy for anybody. No, it's not. Wasn't easy for the master. And you're not above him. Submission is when something is not your will. If you want to do what they want you to do, there's no submission involved. This is agreement. You don't even have an opportunity to submit. 
until what they want you to do, you do not want to do. You don't even have an opportunity to submit until you have that situation. Your will is not their will. So you see. <laughs> you want me to talk about those expensive cars some more? <laughs> and the nice houses? <laughs> if you be willing and obedient. What will happen? Come on, help me out. You'll, you'll eat the good of the land. If you're obedient and you're respectful and show honor, it'll go well with you. Is that right? And you'll live a long time on the earth. Are these things worth getting a hold of our flesh? Are these things worth? And, of course, just not messing up your life, not messing up what God did for you. <clears throat> Anyway, Numbers 13, let's look at what happened to them. The Bible says what happened to them happened as examples, and we're warned not to do what they did. Well, how did they slip into this? In Numbers 13, God had brought His people through amazing signs and wonders and miracles out of Egyptian bondage. I mean, it took the awesome power of God to get this people out of bondage. The, the Egyptians were never letting them go. But here they are, a free people, out of Egypt. And here is the promised land right over here. And God said, I've picked it out for you, and I've given it to you, and now send, uh, send these individuals to go spy out the land. So they sent the, uh, the 12 spies, one from each tribe, <clears throat> and in uh, Numbers 13, he told them to bring back some of the fruit of the land. So you remember the story? They brought back uh, one cluster of grapes that was so big, two men had to carry it on a, on, a, on a pole. And they brought back other things too, figs, pomegranates. And uh, it was a land that flowed with milk and honey. The abundance of the fruit and the beauty of the land when the Lord tells you something, you can believe it. But he didn't mention those giants. <clears throat> and when they saw them, most of them just freaked out, as we'd say. And verse 26, they came to Moses and Aaron, to all the congregation in the wilderness, and they brought back word to them, and they showed the fruit of the land. And they said, we came to the land where you sent us, and surely it flows with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. Moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. <clears throat> now he saw the same thing they did, didn't he? He saw the giants. He saw the walled cities. But he believes God. And they don't. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they're stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we've gone to search it is a land that eats up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. They renamed the land. God said it's a land that flows with milk and honey, and they said it's a land that will eat you up. And God called it an evil report. Now we know this is unbelief. But you're going to see it's more than that. Or actually to see what unbelief really is. Um, the, for chapter 14, all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them, Would God we'd have died in the land of Egypt? Or would God we'd died in this, in this wilderness? 
And wherefore has the Lord brought us into the land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return to Egypt? And they said one to another, let us make a captain and let us return into Egypt. What is this? This is full out rebellion. They're going to replace the leaders God gave them. And they're going to go back to Egypt. It's interesting, when you look up the word uh, unbelief in the New Testament, a number of times the same word that's translated uh, unbelief is translated disobedience. It's the same word. There are at least two kinds of unbelief. Paul said that when he was Saul persecuting the church, he said, he said, I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. He did it ignorantly in unbelief. But in Hebrews 3 and 4, it tells us that these folks, they could not enter in because of unbelief. And that unbelief means unpersuadable. It's not unbelief because of ignorance. It's a refusal to believe. They had seen what God had done for them in bringing them out of Egypt. They had seen what God had done in providing for them. They had no reason to doubt Him. But they made a choice and they rebelled and they blamed others. Can you see this? They spoke against their leaders. When you come to the next thing God has for you, it's going to take faith. I said, it's going to take faith every time. And in order to do it, you're going to have to overcome fear. And when you're facing fear and you're facing challenges, you'll do one of two things. If you're too proud, you'll harden yourself and resist. But if you'll humble yourself... You'll repent and ask for help. Even if you're not there, you're willing to get there. Would the Lord had helped them if they had responded differently? Yes. If they had said, Lord, I know you said that, but look at them giants. Look at those guys. I mean, how in the world? But Lord, help us. <clears throat> if they had just done that, what is that? Willingness. If you're at least willing, if you're not yet obedient, but you're at least willing, you give the Lord something to work with. You say, I'm, I'm willing to do it. I, I'm struggling here. But help me. But if you just harden your heart and stiffen your neck and you start talking rebellion and you start talking against your leaders, you're about to be destroyed. Can you see this, friends? Let's keep reading. <clears throat> They're saying, let's get us some new leaders. Let's make us captain. Let's return to Egypt. Is that the plan of God? Get a new captain. <laughs> let's get us a new pastor. <laughs> Somebody that doesn't challenge us all the time. <clears throat> Somebody that does what we, what we want them to do. <laughs> Don't wait on that to happen around here. <laughs> you didn't vote us in. You can't vote us out. <laughs> you can't call the denomination. You can't cut off our funding. <laughs> Man, it's wonderful to be free. I said, it's wonderful to be free. <laughs> let, us, let us make us a captain. Let's go to Egypt. Now, now, what am I talking about? The spirit of this. If you had been there, what would you have done? <laughs> there were two guys 
standing out like a sore thumb. Hmm? That we're saying, we are going to do what the Lord told us to do. And if he told us to do it, we can do it. Let's go get her. Right? Two out of hundreds of thousands. Would you have been swept up with the rest of the bunch? <laughs> Let's keep reading. Why, why are we talking about this? I know a lot of you know this story. You've read it before. Why are we doing this right now? I'm believing the Lord that you and I are going to identify the spirit of rebellion and disobedience. We're going to see it real clearly. So that any time we're tempted or pulled that way, we're going to stop. And we're not going to yield to it. Hmm? Are you with me? Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes. And they spoke to all the children of Israel, of Israel saying, The land which we pass through to search it, it's an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, He'll bring us into this land and give it to us. A land that flows with milk and honey. Verse 9, only what? Why did they not go in, according to Hebrews 3 and chapter 4? Because of their unbelief. What does it call it here? Rebellion. rebellion. Unbelief is rebellion. When the Lord tells you to do something, and because of fear, you, you refuse to do it, it's not just an innocent, people say, well, that innocent doubt. No, it's not innocent doubt. It's defiance. It's a refusal to obey. And it's serious stuff. It's devilish. When the Lord says go into the land, what should you do? You should go. Right? But they're saying no, we can't. And no, we won't. And you can't make us. And in fact, we're going to replace you. Right? This is rebellion. Rebellion. Who's inspiring this? Who are, who's influencing them right now? Not God. God's enemy is influencing them to rebel against God. They said, don't rebel against the Lord. And don't fear the people of the land. When you're facing something that's scary to you, what you need is help. Right? You need the Lord's help. You need His strength. To overcome this. Who's going to get his help? The humble. Not the proud. The proud. James says it. Peter says it. That God gives grace to the humble. But he resists the proud. He said so humble yourself. Before God. And resist the devil. And he'll flee from you. Do you remember. Uh. When the man brought his uh, son to Jesus' disciples who had been having those fits. And then they weren't able to get him set free. And then Jesus comes down off the mount. And uh, he told, the man asked Jesus, said, you know, I brought him to your disciples and they couldn't help him. But if you can do anything, have mercy on him and help him. And Jesus said, if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believes. And what did the man say? Come on, help me out. He said, I believe. Help my unbelief. Did the Lord help him? I mean, a few verses later, his boy is delivered. His boy is set free. <clears throat> Do you see what he did? Instead of saying, I can't, and yielding to the fear, and yielding to his pride, and getting all defensive, being defensive is being rebellious. It's being defiant. When you're in that case, admit where you are. Don't get all defensive. Don't get afraid somebody's going to find out you're not as spiritual as you tried to portray that you were. They probably already know it. 
Just, just don't. If you need help, ask for help. But don't get defiant. Don't get defensive. That's how you shut off grace from your life. When you get defensive, when you get attitude, you shut off grace. You begin to get resisted instead of helped. What if these guys had come in and they said, and they'd have said, Did you see those giants? Those guys must have been nine foot tall, ten foot tall. Man, they'd just wipe three men of us out in one stroke. In those walls, how are you ever going to get through there? How are you ever going to get in there? But what if they'd have caught themselves and said, Help us, Moses. Help us, Aaron. What do we do? Help us. We, we, we're willing, but man, our faith's just not there right now. Do you think they'd have got help? Yeah. They'd have got help if they'd have done anything except what they did, which was rebel and take attitude. And you know, if, if you read the rest of the story, they got judged. They got told, now you're going to wander around in the, in, in the uh, wilderness for 40 years. And you'd think that'd be a, a wake-up call. But no, then they said, well, now we're going to go up to the mountain and fight. Verse 40, Numbers 14, 40. They said, we're here. We're going to go up to the place the Lord has promised for because we've sinned. And verse 41, Moses said what? Why are you going to transgress the commandment of the Lord? It's not going to prosper. Go not up. The Lord's not among you. Um, you'll be smitten before your enemies. The Amalekites and Canaanites are there. Like you said, you'll fall by the sword. You've turned away from the Lord. The Lord won't be with you. Verse 44, but what? <laughs> but what? You see, it's not about ignorance. He said, come on, let's go. They said, we can't. And we're not, no, we're going back to Egypt. We're going to get us a new boss. And uh, so and then the Lord said, okay, what you've been saying is going to happen. You're going to wander around, go back into the wilderness. Fine, you don't want to go, go back into the wilderness. The rebellious will dwell in a dry land. You don't want to do what he wants you to do? You can do your own thing, but I assure you, you're not going to enjoy it. So then they say, oh, oh, Okay. Well, we're going. We're going now. He said, no, don't go. No, we're going. Can you see? If you'd have said up, what are they going to say? Down. Down. If you say go, what are they going to say? No. If you say stay, what are they going to say? No. I'm going. Why would you be that way? Because the devil is this way. And he's influencing the whole earth. The spirit of this is in the air. Did you see this? And if you and I are not going to be influenced by it, we've got to be strong. And when we feel this way and these thoughts and feelings come, we've got to be immediately identified and resisted and go, no, uh-uh, I'm not doing that. I'm not going to get attitude. I'm not going to get defiant. I am going to be willing and obedient. I'm going to submit to the will of God and to those he tells me to submit to. I'm going to do what he tells me to do. Right? And I'm going to eat the good of the land. Yeah. And it's going to go well with me. Yeah. And I'm going to live a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The rest of the world can do their rebellious thing if they want to and pay the price. But I'm going to be enjoying the good of the land yeah. and getting older and older. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, anybody believe this besides me? But they presume to go up to the hilltop and, and the Amalekites came down and beat the pudding out of them. <laughs> That's what happens when you won't listen. Go with me in closing, I think. Matthew, the eighth chapter. You need this verse. Matthew 8. Do you think this is worth camping on a while? Where else do you hear this? 
You're not going to get it from the world, are you? Say it out loud. I refuse to be rebellious. It's of the devil. I refuse to be defiant and disobedient. I'll be like my master. Meek, humble, submissive, obedient, faithful, and it'll go well with me. Hallelujah. It'll go well with me. Favor will go before you. Thank you, Lord. In uh, Matthew, the eighth chapter, <clears throat> and verse five, when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came to him a centurion beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant lies at home, sick of palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus said to him, I'll come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, go. And he goes. And to another, come. And he comes. And to my servant, do this. And he does it. Next verse. When Jesus heard it, he marveled. Now for Jesus to marvel is no small thing. He marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say to you, I have not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. Hallelujah. Verse 13, he said, Go your way. As you have believed, so be it done to you. And his servant was healed in the selfsame hour. We see that unbelief and rebellion are connected. And here we see submission and faith are connected. Can you see this, friends? This man is a soldier. He's had some success. He's moved up through the ranks. He has both soldiers under him. He probably had at least a hundred under him. And also he has servants. And when he tells them, when he gives them an order, he is not used to any discussion. This is the Romans. They had strict discipline. The most disciplined army in the world at that time, I suppose. And the most successful. And he and, and, and when the Lord uh, said he would heal, he said, I, I just need the command from you, sir. If you'd give the order <laughs> that my servant be healed. And, and the Lord, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit. He said, now boys, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> that is faith. Now when Jesus says that is faith, we ought to be all ears. Is that right? Well, what made it such great faith? What was it? The acknowledgement of who's over and who's under. Who says and who does. Right? He said, I tell my soldier, do this. And out the door he goes. I tell my servant, go get this. And he does it. And if you'll just say the word, my servant will be healed. Would you give the order, please, sir? And the master was so pleased. And he marveled. He said, I hadn't seen faith like this in the whole country. Well, I guess that'd include his staff sitting right there. <laughs> Do you want to please the master? Do you want the Lord to look at you? And go, now that's what I'm talking about. That's some real faith there. That's greater faith than anybody in the county. Look at that. What kind of faith is it going to be? It's when you don't wallow around and you don't wrestle around. You don't argue. When the Lord says, by my stripes, you are healed. You go, well, that's it then. That's it. 
That's it. I've got the command. I've got the word. You don't go, well, yeah, but what about? And how come? And I've tried everything and I've done everything. See, all that is just disrespect, dishonor. You say, permission to be healed, sir. <laughs> he says, you are healed by my son. Thank you, sir. That's it. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. That's it. Stand on your feet, everybody.